The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we start with breaking news out of Southwest Bear County, where it looks like law enforcement interrupted a human smuggling operation. It's still a very active scene there, and this one is just southwest of Somerset. Yeah, there actually appear to be scenes. We're hearing there are possibly three scenes in connection with this human smuggling investigation. The first one is on the map here near Benton City Road and Kinney Road. The second is at I-35 and Loop 410, the interchange there. This is a live picture from Sky 12 where you see an 18 wheeler has been pulled over. You can see a number of marked and unmarked vehicles. We are told that ICE is investigating this, so it does appear to in fact be a human smuggling operation. There is still yet a third unknown location at a home. John Paul Barajas is on Benton City Road and joins us live with what law enforcement are telling him right now. John Paul. Steve, Stephanie, off the bat, there's still a lot of questions that we're waiting to get answers to. But as you mentioned, there's three scenes and those three scenes started because people in this area called sheriff's deputies about some suspicious activity about an 18 wheeler either unloading or loading people onto it. And those caused those three scenes that you mentioned, one of them right here behind us now in those three scenes. At least four people have been detained. You mentioned the one on the 410 935, the one we're at, and there's a third one. There's a third one at a home. We're still waiting to get the address of that home or why it's involved in this investigation. At this time, Bear County Sheriff's deputies don't know how many undocumented migrants there might have been in this entire case. And right now they're assisting Homeland Security investigations. So still lots of information to come from this. We'll try to bring you the latest as we can. John Paul Barajas, KSAP 12 News. Yeah, obviously we'll stay on top of it. Thank you, John Paul. The reason for red flag or fire danger warnings playing out in real time in South Bear County tonight. Look at this fire crews trying to get a grass fire there under control. This is in the 1500 block of sea spray. Yeah, we first told you about this one at five o'clock. Crews have been out there for more than two hours. At last report, we were told that the flames have destroyed 15 acres and one structure. Our Patty Santos is on the ground there and she joins us live with what's happening there. Patty. Well, the wind is definitely picking up right now as uh, we go into the evening. But I can tell you from what we're seeing right now, it looks like this fire, thankfully, is under control after all of those hours. But the situation is that this wind is going to continue. And this is what rural communities have to deal with. Look at all of this. This is all dry vegetation, dry uh, trees right next to homes. And so the people that live in these communities really have these two things to worry about. Their surroundings surroundings and also the lack of a uh, fire hydrant in some cases to be near to these communities. So as we go into tomorrow, communities really have to uh, pay attention and hopefully keep an eye on those uh, open flames. If you know, don't burn anything at all. We're going to continue to stay here and bring you more updates. We're hoping to get an update on how many homes, if any other homes that were impacted here and we bring you that on the night beat. We'll send it back to you. And All right, thank you, Patty. And that's an indication right there, mm -hmm. Adam, of just how dry it is on Sunday. Very dry. Dew points have fallen down into the 30s and even into the 20s earlier today. So the very dry air in place, low relative humidity, and gusty winds. We had a peak wind gust of 41 miles per hour measured at the airport. Most recent wind gusts, 39 miles per hour. And we've seen gusts all across our area of between 30 and 40 miles per hour throughout the day today. So it's a combination of the very dry air and the gusty wind that can spread flames rapidly. So even discarded cigarettes, anything that could cause a spark can quickly ignite a, a grass fire. And the grass is very dry right now as well. It's like tinder out there. A cold front has moved in. You see this big temperature difference. We go from 44 in Fredericksburg to 52 in San Antonio to 73 in Catula. Huge temperature difference. Our temperatures are dropping quickly this evening. They're falling off fast. Grab a jacket. Chilly out there and, and remaining gusty as well. The winds are going to be howling at about 30 miles per hour overnight periodically and mostly clear near freezing in the morning. We're going to talk about what this cold front means for the rest of tomorrow on into the weekend and even a shift in our pattern that includes some rain chances in a bit.
Thank you, Adam. $10 million worth of liquid meth. That's what police in the city of Far found during a drug seizure. Yeah, those drugs were on their way actually to a place far away from the border, but the seizure itself is part of a much larger pattern. Our Alicia Barrera spoke with Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar about all the drugs that investigators are finding in our communities. Look at this. While on patrol, officers in the city of Far observed something unusual about these tanker trailers. Three men were pouring a liquid from large barrels into five gallon buckets. The liquid was tested and determined to be methamphetamine or meth, a potent and addictive stimulant drug the Bear County Sheriff's Office has a close eye on. It is concerning that we're seeing these things come through, but on, on the bright side of things, we are doing a good job of catching it. And they're working with local, state and federal authorities to do so. It's quite possible that there's more flowing through. According to BCSO, last month, cocaine led their drug seizures at more than 23,000 grams with a street value of about $928,000. Meth came in at second place with more than 9,000 grams valued at nearly $200,000 taken off the streets. And already this month, about $4,500 worth of meth have been seized. For January, we uh, were happy to report that we took about uh, $1.1 million worth of narcotics off of the street. Uh, here for February, it looks like we're on track to, to uh, better that. The big goal for BCSO is to prevent violent crimes. And according to Sheriff Salazar, the drugs that are linked to violence in Bear County aren't the kilos of meth or cocaine. It's usually the small drug deals of marijuana that often turn bad. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. The I's are dotted, the T's are crossed. San Antonio is set to kick off its ready to work training and education program in just a few weeks. City Council approved a half dozen contracts today that were needed to really get things started. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us how it all breaks down. Approved by voters in November 2020, SA Ready to Work is now ready to go. So if you're listening out there, San Antonio, this is a game changer. The city is projecting more than 28,000 people will enroll in certification or degree programs that will lead to jobs in in-demand fields. The goal is for the $183 million program to cover most tuition gaps left by other grants and financial aid. To be eligible for the program, you have to be a city resident who's allowed to work in the U.S. You can't already be enrolled in college courses, and your household income can't be of more than two and a half times the federal poverty guidelines. That's about $34,000 for an individual. The city has trumpeted its partnerships with local employers who have pledged to hire program graduates and whose guidance helps determine what kind of training is offered. As they begin to tell us, here are the occupations that are most critically in need, here are the skill sets, the credentials that individuals need to have to obtain those jobs. Though the city will bankroll ready to work with sales tax dollars, it is contracted with four different groups to actually handle the intake and case management. Workforce Solutions Alamo, Alamo College's District, Restore Education, and Project Quest. If you're looking for a job, if you're looking for training, Project Quest is the agency that you would go to to get that information, access those services, access the funding. You'll be able to go through any of these groups to get into the program. Enrollment doesn't begin until April, but you can pre-register by calling 311. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Heart health top of mind since February is American Heart Month, but for some parents this month, is also about remembering how their children with heart issues fought and won or sadly lost. Ursula Perry shows us a program for these parents and children that beautifully strings together the moments of that battle. These are the beads of courage shown by the Nelson family. It's pretty, pretty long, longer than you would think, two weeks. I don't even think you can see all of it in the picture. <laughs> Two weeks of memories, 118 beads worth of moments, procedures and diagnoses for heart conditions that little Mackenzie Jane in the end could not survive. We have uh, beads on there that represent the first time I held her, uh, the first oh. time my wife held her, the first time her brother held her. She died on July 29th, and there's a bead for that too. And it's the biggest, it's the heaviest, and it actually represents what we feel it's the heaviest emotion um in the whole process beads of courage is a nationwide program that is now at university health it's coordinated through child life specialists like jessica luna and there's special 
beads for each each thing that a child goes through, whether that's just an overnight stay in the hospital or an x-ray. But then there's some special beads for things like an act of courage, whether that be something really remarkable that the parents did or the child did. And for the moms and dads to be able to see, we made it through this. We did this. Um, you know, I... I had a fighter and, and we got through this together as a family and that's remarkable. Each bead is unique, each one handmade and curated from artists from all around the country. Some families have had the luck of having multiple strands, sometimes with hundreds upon hundreds of beads recording their acts of courage and heart. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Check out traffic right now. Let's go to 410 and Evers. This is usually a busy spot. Not too bad right now, though. As you can see, traffic in both directions moving smoothly. Into at six, already home to Texas A&M, San Antonio, Toyota, and other major manufacturers. The South Side has a lot going for it. It's also seeing more new businesses and new housing developments. Believing further growth is inevitable? Jesse DiGoriato says after 40 years, the South San Antonio Chamber of Commerce changing its name. It is now the South Texas Business Partnership. From up here, the growth on the South Side seems undeniable, and so is the potential for more to come, even among small businesses. South Side Craft Soda, postcard of South San Antonio for me. We give everything a South Texas twist. As the South San Antonio Chamber's former economic development director, Andrew Anguiano says this part of town can do what others can't. Capture South Texas perfectly, right? The same geography, culturally similar. How do we kind of connect our commonality for economic prosperity. A realization which led to the South San Antonio Chamber of Commerce rebranding itself as the South Texas Business Partnership. The theme for South Texas Business Partnership is all roads lead south. By making the most of San Antonio's strengths, for instance, in manufacturing and logistics and its relationships with communities to its south, ahead of even further growth. I think collectively we all know that we have a responsibility to do it well, to plan it well, and working together is going to get that done. We all want to be successful and the way to be successful is together. They say businesses and communities could benefit by creating opportunities for others like a small manufacturer of craft sodas. Being able to understand what's going on logis with logistics in regards to, to Laredo, maybe even Mexico. A network they say such as the South Texas Partnership has a potential in another sense. It gives us that attention that we need. On the South Side, Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. You know, we like the South Side so much, we want to stay there again. To give you this live shot here, 51 degrees right now. It's just a really lovely, lovely evening, kind of quiet. It's been fairly nice this week. Yeah, that wind really kicked up, though, when yes. the front came through. Adam Kasky has more on your forecast coming up. All right, so the weather outside, man, beautiful day. Then the wind kicked up That's and the problem. temperatures, whoo dropped off. Also, we're under a red flag warning, which is why we're also we warned you about this, that whenever the winds kick up, you're going to see more of this also because it's so dry out mm -hmm. there, Adam. We need rain. We do. We could use some rain and there is some some opportunities in the days ahead in the extended forecast. It's going to be a cold night tonight, though, first and foremost, still breezy overnight but not as windy tomorrow. Come sunrise, the wind is really going to start to pump the brakes. And then a few rain chances in the extended forecast. We'll talk about that shift in our weather pattern. But let's get to the current conditions out there. I mean, the temperatures have fallen off quickly. We were well into the 70s just a few hours ago. Now we're at 52 degrees at the airport, dew point of 31, and that steady north wind at 20 to 30 miles per hour. You look at the dew points, mostly down in the lower 30s, so the dry air is in place. Combined with the gusty winds, it gives us that higher fire danger in the sense that if a fire starts, such as a grass fire, wildfire, or even structure fire, it can spread rapidly. And now there is going to be a change, but not until we get into early next week. Tomorrow, Saturday, very dry air, but luckily not as windy. Sunday, still lack of humidity, but by Monday and Tuesday of next week, that's when you'll notice some stickiness back in the air for at least a brief period of time, a little bit of humidity early next week. Look at these temperatures across the state. We go from 78 in Laredo, even 79 Corpus Christi to 32 
in Amarillo. And you see where the wind is coming from. The wind's coming from the north, so it's pushing that cooler air southward. And we're just right in the transition zone at the moment with our temperatures quickly falling off, not only because of that cold air getting pushed in, but also the sun setting. We're losing our daylight and those temperatures are dropping quickly as a result of the two factors there. Catula is still 73, Creasel Springs 72. But then you get into the hill country, we're in the 40s. 52 officially here in San Antonio, but that's changing pretty quickly. This is what you can expect tomorrow morning. Most of us pretty close to the freezing point. I think north of Highway 90 is where we'll have a light freeze. But 28 Rock Springs, 31 Canyon Lake. You get to Bernie, 28, Timberwood Park, 31. Even Holotus, Stone Oak, about 32 degrees. The rest of us pretty close, if not just briefly hitting the freezing point early tomorrow morning. Tomorrow afternoon. It's going to stay cool. Most of our afternoon is going to be spent in the 50s. Some of us will briefly hit 60 degrees, such as Castroville, even La Soya area, but I think most of us topping out in the upper 50s right near 60. We rebound pretty quickly. If you don't like that cooler air, Saturday, Sunday, well into the 60s, pretty close to average for this time of year. And Monday and Tuesday, it's back to 80 degrees before our next cold front hits. And that next cold front is going to hit us in the middle part of next week. So by next Wednesday, another big temperature drop. And that's part of the overall weather pattern shift that at least gives us some hope for some areas of rain. We had the activity in North Texas and Oklahoma overnight and earlier this morning. Now the action is moving over to the eastern seaboard. Wide swath of precipitation. I look at that moderate and heavy rain with a bit of envy right now. But here's what's going to happen with our pattern. We've got one little disturbance that's going to drop into northern Mexico on Sunday. You'll notice increasing cloudiness becoming gray pretty quickly on Sunday ahead of the system. It's going to throw some energy our way. So by Monday, a few showers could pop up Monday and even on into Tuesday. By Wednesday and Thursday of next week, more promising big dip in the upper level of flow could give us the potential for uh, even a better chance of a showers and maybe some thunderstorms. So there's some hope, but we really have to wait until the middle and end of next week for those rain chances. Otherwise, tomorrow morning, right near freezing, of course, the typically cooler locations at the freezing point in the morning. Combined with a little bit of a breeze, it'll feel like the 20s periodically tomorrow morning. Only 59 the high, not much of a breeze for most of the day, however. And then Saturday morning, we do it again at 33, but a lot of sunshine on Saturday will get us to the mid 60s. Sunday becoming fairly gray or increasing clouds and increasing humidity. And right now we've got 20 to 30% chance of rain Monday through Wednesday and slightly elevated chance Thursday. Stay tuned for the updates. All right, Adam, thank you. Now we want to go back to some breaking news that we brought to you during the beginning of the show. We'll give you a live view here from Sky 12 where you're getting a look at a home. This is the third scene that police are investigating now as they investigate a human smuggling operation. We know that an 18 wheeler was in one of those scenes, uh, but this is one of the other scenes where police are investigating right now on South Kenny Road and Briggs. We're being told that there was a bus there and there's also a tow truck there on the scene taking away some cars, but we are being told that people were found in a vehicle. I think you're actually seeing some of those people who are sitting on the ground right now that were apparently the subjects of this human smuggling operation that was broken up. As we said, there were three different locations. This is the third one we didn't know, the home that we were wondering. And as Stephanie has said, it's South Kinney and Briggs. You can see they are towing away vehicles at that uh, location. They have a bus to presumably take away some of the people uh, that were being smuggled. I don't know if this was a safe house where these uh, people were being kept or exactly what is happening right now. Our John Paul Barajas is on the scene. We continue to cover this and of course we'll update it throughout this newscast, but we found out the third scene, the most active scene by far, as you see this live picture from Sky 12. And now that we're back in the studio, Larry Ramirez joins us here now. All right, so let's talk about the Spurs. They did beat the Thunder. Yes, they closed out the first half of the rodeo road trip with a much needed win. That's going to do a lot for the young Spurs confidence. And if you can pick an MVP for one game, it's got to go to Jakob Pertl because he had a fantastic night. Plus, in girls high school basketball, the Clark Cougars feel they have all the right ingredients coming up. He was a star. I told him after the game, you were a star tonight. We don't win the game without what you did tonight. 
without a doubt. Pop is talking about Jakob Pertl, who had 20 points and a career high 17 rebounds last night in big board sports. Coach Pop picked up regular season win, 1,333 last night after the Spurs beat the Thunder, 114 to 106. He's now in sole possession of the number two spot in all-time regular season wins, and he needs three more to top Don Nelson for number one all-time. Kelvin Johnson led the Spurs offensive attack last night with 22 points. He's one of six Spurs, including all five starters, to reach double digits. Jakob Pertl was a beast with 20 points, 17 rebounds, and two block shots, his 19th double-double this season. Now, with six players out, the Thunder were forced to play a lot of small ball more than normal. Pertle was asked that that helped the Spurs out. Yeah, it was one of our advantages. Um, they, they did have a couple of really small lineups out there. Uh, but we we kind of just stuck to our game. To be honest, we're, we're trying to improve in our game the way we want to play basketball. Obviously, like if we see mismatches and stuff, we want to take advantage of that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to get better every game at what we do best. We stay solid on defense. I mean, uh, I mean, we had Yak at the rim. He was amazing. Um, and we got some great defenders out there. So, uh, I mean, it was just, you know, locked in, was on the string. I mean, obviously, you know, we had some slip ups here and there, but uh, I mean, nobody's perfect, we're all human. Uh, but so we just look at the film, get better, you know, and um, at the road trip on to the next game. Spurs will now get a long break before resuming the rodeo road trip Friday, February 25th at the Wizards. Spurs fans will get to see DeJounte play this Sunday, though, in the NBA All-Star game. He was an injury replacement, but certainly has All-Star stats. He ranked second with 11 triple-doubles this season. Plus, he leads the league in both steals at two and deflections at 3.9 per game. In girls high school basketball, the Clark Cougars opened the playoffs by beating Clemens 70-34 in the Class 6A by district round. And now they're getting ready to face Cedar Park Vista Ridge in round two. The Cougars are 31-2 overall and finished the regular season ranked third in the state in Class 6A by the Texas Association of Basketball Coaches. We asked Coach Huey why she thinks this team can win it all this season. It's just that recipe that we have. You know, we have, we have the talent. We have the height, we have the speed, um, we have the shooters, we have the defense, we have the chemistry, um, we have the, the, the basketball savviness, we've got the recipe and they understand their roles too and that's a big piece to it. You know, we don't, if you look at our stats, you don't have one player who's clearly outscoring another player. You, you try to shut down one player, another player steps up to the challenge and that's really and truly what breeds success, not one player. Um, the unselfishness of our teammates is huge. They're not worried about how many points they're going to score, they're worried about how many points their team is going to score and I think that's a big piece that sometimes we overlook and, and you know I understand have, you know we've all played the game you know we understand we want that we want that stat but at the end of the day they understand the stat that's a, that means the most to them is a win at the end of the night. It is all about team first Clark will face Cedar Park Vista Ridge in the class 6A second round tomorrow night at 8 at Buda Johnson. Playoff time. Playoff yes. Yeah thanks Larry. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Finally, we're seeing some relief from COVID. Local case numbers are down, but that doesn't mean we are out of the woods yet. Now joining us now to make sense of all of this, the COVID and how it's affecting our health, is infectious disease specialist Dr. Ruth Berggren with UT San Antonio. Uh, Dr. Ruth, always a pleasure to have you with us every week. Um, now, Metro Health, we know, reported 404 new COVID cases today. Obviously, that's well below the 1,000 plus daily uh, case numbers that we were seeing just weeks ago. But if you can, just put that 404 into perspective for us. Is that a good sign? We are definitely on the way down from this big mountain of a surge from Omicron that we've had, um, but we're still at 17.9% positivity in the community. And if you remember, what we strive for is to get down below 10 and ideally below five. And that percent refers to of all the people going to get tested for COVID because they think they've had have it or they were exposed, what percent are positive? And so when you when that number goes down to 5%, you can really start to breathe more easily and talk about, you know, maybe not having to wear your mask all the time. We are not there. It's going to take us another two weeks at least to get down to five to 10 percent uh, positivity rate. The hospitals, meanwhile, are still stressed. I was rounding today. It no longer feels like we're in the throes of a horrible crisis as it used to. 
Um, however, there are lots and lots of people in the emergency room, and every day we get messages from our chiefs telling us to please please help move things along because folks are waiting in the emergency rooms to get in. So you don't want to get sick. Yeah, interesting what you're seeing at UT Health San Antonio as well as University Hospital. I, I talk about the number of people that are vaccinated that are getting sick or hospitalized. Any idea the kind of percentages that we're talking about there? Yeah, so I think rather than talk about percentages which change, um, it's helpful to talk about some big principles. And there's been some studies released recently that are exciting to me and I wanna share that people who have had long COVID who get vaccinated against COVID actually have a reduction in their symptoms. So if you have long COVID and you've never been vaccinated, go get vaccinated. That's an important piece of information. These same uh, large studies, it's an aggregation of a bunch of studies together, also showed that people who've never been vaccinated against, uh, who, who have been vaccinated against COVID and then get COVID have a reduced risk of getting long COVID. So people who worry that don't get vaccinated because you can still get COVID, don't worry about that because you are preventing lots of bad things. You're preventing hospitalization and death. For the most part, hospitalization, you're certainly preventing death. You're also preventing long COVID. Very interesting numbers there. Now, you just mentioned a moment ago that you think uh, in about two weeks we're going to continue to, you know, we're going to continue to see these numbers go down and maybe in two weeks we might see the most improvement. However, we know that already weeks ago some local school districts got rid of their mask mandates and I'm assuming that you think that's not appropriate. It's not time for that yet to ditch the masks. No, it's not time to ditch the masks. Um, I am personally wearing a KN95 mask or a surgical mask or double surgical masks every time I'm indoors with other people. I only take my mask off when I'm outside or when I'm in my own home. And I strongly urge others to do likewise. I strongly urge school children to keep their masks on. Getting COVID is no fun and you can get COVID anytime we still have 17.9 percent positivity in the community so keep your masks on and don't get covid because you don't have to uh, dr Berger, i have heard the theory that that the numbers are basically and that's this is nationwide not just in san antonio that the numbers are likely underreported because so many people are taking tests at home and if they turn up positive then they quarantine and things like that are, do you believe that that is the fact, is still a fact? And are you still hearing from people on a daily basis who are getting COVID, who need medicines to get better? It's absolutely the case. Um, in the last week alone, I get one or two or three calls every single day from people that are in my social circle or in my world somehow that get referred to me and I'm having to prescribe for them medicines. Good news is I have something to prescribe. We have Paxlovid, Molnupiravir, Fluvoxamine. We have really good medications now that can help people stay out of the hospital and prevent them from getting desperately ill. But the fact that I am seeing so many calls from so many people tells me that in fact, the numbers that are being reported on the websites are definitely lower than what's happening. Now, as we head into the spring now, what are some things that we also need to be aware of? And the reason I'm asking that question is kind of side by side with the question that I asked you before, which is that, yeah, numbers are going down. However, during these last two years, we have been on a roller coaster. Well, um, you know, what could happen is that we could get a break for a couple of months, as we did back when the Delta surge ended and before the Omicron began and there could be another variant that would emerge from somewhere. Um, if that happens, we're not gonna panic. We're gonna continue to do what we know how to do, and we're gonna continue to promote vaccination. But because that is a reality that could happen, all the people that are unboosted right now in San Antonio, they need to go and get their boosters. Absolutely go get your boosters, protect yourself against the next variant that may come along. Dr. Ruth Berger with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio as always appreciate your time and your insight. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this. 
all know that journals are special, but this one is giving us a look into the life of a woman who is pretty much a pioneer for the black community in Wilson County. RJ Marquez tells us about this remarkable woman who is now being honored after decades of dedicating her life to the education of black children. You might not recognize the name Minnie Washington Yates when it comes to black history in South Texas, but her impact in education is felt to this day. Washington Yates was born in 1878 in Wilson County. She's the daughter of former slaves and despite hardships, knew going to school meant a better life. She uh, actually attended Guadalupe College and that was uh, something very unheard of in that day and time for a, a person, a black person. To Renee L. Winters Jackson is Washington Yates' great granddaughter. She transcribed a journal written by her great grandmother decades after she died in 1970. I was so full of emotion and a lot of it brought, you know, memories and it kind of depicted what she was going through. The journal showed Washington Yates' commitment to education for her family and black children. She and her husband, R.C., established the Mount Moriah Baptist Church and School in Poth in 1916. It was a place where black children could feel safe during school hours. My great-grandmother had uh, spearheaded the education for the black children because, you know, at that time they were not um, permitted to go to the white school. Winners Jackson's cousin, Jesse Brown, worked with the Texas Historical Commission to honor their great-grandmother. The commission approved a Texas historical marker last October for Washington Yates, the first marker dedicated to a black woman in Wilson County. It's set to be erected this spring in Poe. Her efforts have not gone unnoticed or uh, unrecognized, and we're following as much as we can to the next generations to let them know you must be educated. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Her efforts have not gone unnoticed. No, definitely not. I love it now that there's this push now to have more of a history from our black community here in our area now pushed to the forefront. It's really important. All right, here is a live look right now. 50 degrees over our city here. Nice uh, live shot for us. Beautiful evening. Adam. Yeah, breezy out there and temperatures are falling off quickly. OK, so you'll notice the temperatures falling pretty quickly this evening with the cold front that's moved through in that northerly wind. Now earlier today, a little after two o'clock, we actually hit 76 degrees, but now we've dropped down to near 50. So the difference a cold front makes just in the matter of hours. And actually, we were over 80 south of town. This is earlier today. High temperature of 82 Pleasanton, even 85 Catula. But all temperatures are dropping quickly. We're going to talk about that, what you can expect tomorrow morning, who's likely to see a freeze, and even a shift in our weather pattern that could mean some rain in just a bit. All right, so a runaway tire in Pennsylvania really took the in your face up a level. All right, Spring Township Ooh. Police dash cam. Look at that. Wow. In the perfect spot right there. So you can see all of it. That video shows the tire come off of an oncoming truck, hop the curb, heading straight just like that into the windshield of a parked cruiser. Inside that cruiser, two police officers. They were not hurt. The police unit, not so lucky. Yes. As you can see, it took some serious damage from that tire hitting it, and it's going to need some time in the shop before it'll be ready to get back on the road. For them, it is not the start of a good year. Oh, you know, Steve, <laughs> you with those puns, I got to tell you. Yeah, oh, I get sorry. it. <laughs> uh, all right, well, it's Thursday. Yes, Friday. You know what? You know how I was reminded of that? Oh. My friend Adam Kasky's tie. Yeah, that's right. This is the official Thermometer Thursday tie. It's got the logo all over. Oh, okay, nice. Okay, nice. Custom made by a good friend of mine. Yes. All right, so right now we're right near 50 degrees, but look at 9 o'clock. We'll be at 43. 11 o'clock at 40, and by midnight we're going to be dipping down into the upper 30s. So get ready for a quick cool down this evening. All right, let's talk about everything. It's been a gusty day out there. Maximum wind gust of 41 miles per hour earlier today in San Antonio. Most recent gust 39. Honda gusting to 32. You get the idea, and these winds will continue to be pretty high through the night tonight, and we still have some dry air in place, of course, with that northerly dry wind. Dew points right now right around the 30 degree mark, so very dry air has settled back into town after that brief little hint of humidity yesterday. It's going to stay dry into the weekend and Sunday some increasing humidity, but you're not going to notice it. By Monday and Tuesday, you'll actually notice a bit of humidity in the air, and that's when our weather pattern shifts. And remember, humidity helps make us rain, helps generate rain. You need the humidity in the air, and it could help kickstart some showers. 
at least a slight chance early next week and possibly an elevated chance by the end of next week. Temperatures locally, for the most part, right near 50 degrees. Some locations, of course, in the upper 40s at this hour, but you go farther north in Texas, Amarillo's at 32, Lubbock 37, Abilene 36, Dallas 35. That's where the wind is coming from. So that cooler air is just continuing to be pumped into town and our temperatures will rapidly be falling off this evening. So Catula, for example, you're at 73, but not for long. Carrizo Springs has already quickly fallen out of the 70s just during the last 30 minutes and is now down in the mid 60s. So we're seeing these temperatures fall off quickly and this is what you can expect tomorrow morning right near freezing for most of us and even a little below freezing, especially north of Highway 90. So Canyon Lake, Kerrville, Bandera, Pipe Creek, Comfort, Sisterdale. We could go on and on basically 1604 within San Antonio on the north side of town uh, right around the freezing point actually briefly hitting freezing but elsewhere it's going to be pretty close so take the necessary precautions for the plants and pets tonight just in case because it's going to be close everywhere. Tomorrow afternoon, we don't warm up a whole lot after what we had the past couple of days, you know, 80 degrees and we're only going to be near 60 tomorrow afternoon. So think of it as most of the day will be spent in the 50s. At least most of the afternoon will be spent in the 50s. This weekend, we rebound back into the 60s. Then by Monday and Tuesday, back to 80 degrees. But then another cold front hits. Another yo-yo temperature roller coaster ride in terms of temperature. So let's talk about our overall weather pattern. We had the showers and thunderstorms in North Texas yesterday, even West Texas. Today, all that activity has actually developed more and pushed eastward and moving on to the eastern seaboard. They've got that big shield of rain and even some snow across the Great Lakes and they don't need it. That's why I look at that radar loop a little envious. They don't need it. This is the newest drought monitor issued today. We of course could use it. Now this does not take into account the rain that fell last night along and north of Interstate 20. But you look around our neck of the woods and we've got quite a bit of drought, especially Dimmit, LaSalle, McMullen counties. That's where we've got the deepest drought. But our overall weather pattern is going to be shifting a little bit. And as these disturbances start to drop in from the Pacific Northwest by early next week and the middle of next week, It'll at least give us a shot at some showers and maybe an elevated chance by this time next week. But tomorrow morning, wind chill in the 20s when the wind picks up. But the wind's not going to be noticeable for most of the day tomorrow. It's really going to pump the brakes by sunrise. Near freezing in the morning, 59 for the afternoon high temperature. And then Saturday morning, we do it again right near the freezing point. But at least the afternoons this weekend will be in the 60s. Then those slight rain chances isolated in nature Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and we could actually have an elevated chance Thursday by this time next week. At least there's some hope and something to watch and look forward to. Alrighty, happy Therm Thurs, everybody. Uh, I had an inquiry over the weekend and I wanna share this with you because I know a lot of people run into this issue. This is a common issue with just store-bought thermometers and even sometimes with mine. Uh, you see that little gap in the thermometer there? Don't worry, I'll zoom in. Uh, Tim sent me a message, said, I've tried swinging it. I've tried, you know, in a sock like I do and I've tried a bunch of things. I can't get the liquid to come back together. So often when you drop these thermometers, it's a big shock right when they hit the ground and then it separates the liquid and you have a hard time getting it back together. Here's the secret, here's the trick. Put it in very hot water to make the temperature rise all the way to the top and that gets it back together. It fills those gaps and it all drops and cools at room temp together. Boom, hey. took my advice and bam, his thermometer is working again. This of course, just for the liquid and glass thermometers, not for electronic thermometers. I like your quote there, <laughs> me, quote me. <laughs> I, I didn't know how else to put it. I was like, well, it is me, I mean. Yeah, yeah it's accurate. <laughs> yeah, it is. So that's a good tip uh, and a good thing to do if you happen to get one of those gaps in your liquid and glass thermometers. Anyway, Lupe Arenal of San Antonio, the winner of homemade thermometer this week. Congrats, Lupe, uh, kset.com slash thermometer to win. Woo -woo. Go Lupe. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Adam. We'll, we'll be, be right, right back. back. <laughs>
New this morning, a scary scene for a driver who narrowly escaped a car explosion on the north side of town. This happened on Blanco Road and Loop 410 at the Park North Shopping Center, and that's where police say the driver pulled over after he heard two pops and noticed an orange glow from beneath his windshield wipers. He was able to get his things out of the vehicle before the front end lit up and exploded. Firefighters were able to quickly put out the flames. That driver was not hurt. She didn't want to give her name or show her face, but she says the only reason she still was able to tell her story was because of her brand new television. It was sitting in front of her window when bullets tore into it before seven this morning, stopping them from hitting her. The woman told police she had just entered her door in the 100 block of Ocasa Walk and told two men who were banging on it that they had the wrong house. Two teenagers, meantime, recovering from gunshot wounds at the hospital after being shot on the road. That shooting happened near the intersection of Estrella Street and Glendale Avenue on the city's west side. We warned you it could happen, and it has. We have breaking news of yet another grass fire in South Bear County. Now, all while a red flag warning remains in effect. Now, this one is happening south of 281 and 1604, right near the Atascosa County line. And that's where Patty Santos has been gathering information for us. Patty, what can you see right now? right now from there. Yeah, we can tell you the wind is really whipping out right now. The latest information is that 25 acres have burned, uh, possibly one um, structure that burned down. Okay, Helotus obviously in air, not 29 in Helotus, but near 50 degrees there. You get north into the hill country already down in the 40s, and that's where we're likely to have a brief and light freeze tomorrow morning. Locally, we'll be about 32, 33 degrees, and then by the afternoon, we'll make it well into, or I should say, well into the 50s to near 60. All right, Adam, thank you, and thank you for joining us. See you on the night beat.